welcome to the algorithm seminar. Uh, today we're very happy to have uh, Yaroslav to give a talk here. Uh, he's a junior fellow at Simon's Society of Fellows, conducting postdoctoral research at the Theory of Computation Group at Columbia University under mentorship of uh, Professor Alex Andoni. Uh, he finished his PhD at the John Paul, uh, A. Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Harvard University, advised by Professor Janani Nelson. Uh, he received uh, his uh, bachelor and master degree in computer science from uh, University of Warsaw. Uh, he has a broad a research interest in theoretical computer science and has worked in design and analysis of streaming algorithms the theory of error correcting codes, uh, algorithms related to machine learning, differential privacy, and compressed sensing. Uh, in his dissertation, he described his research in streaming algorithms and error correction, featuring applications of high dimensional probability in these two areas. Um, so I'll welcome our speaker. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So in, in this talk, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, joint work with Parikshit Gopalan, Lun Jahu, and Pritam Nakilan. And the talk concerns uh, calibration uh, problem. So uh, it's um, the calibration is uh, uh, some sort of quality of passive uh, like prediction models. And uh, let, me, let me briefly uh, set up the, 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 the problem. So let's consider some sort of binary classification problem or, like, or binary uh, prediction problem where the outcome is a binary variable, say, whether it's going to rain on a given day or not, or, you know, we can imagine binary class like image classification where we are given a promise that it's, we, that the, the, the algorithm is given a picture of either a cat or a dog, and we want to distinguish whether it's a cat or a dog, indeed. and. As it turns out, uh, often with this kind of binary classification or binary prediction problem, it's desirable not only to give a prediction that's uh, also a binary value, say cut or dog or raining or not raining. It might be uh, useful to have a prediction that's actually a number between, like in the range of zero uh, to one, which is should somehow denote the probability or our belief that the output is one or the output is zero. And this might be, uh, as in the, the the weather case, either because the the actual uncertainty in the uh, in the, the the feature prediction in the the weather in future, or as in the uh, like image classification case, this uncertainty might might come from our model, our like not you know the data, uh, or like uh, determines uh, whether it's a cat or a dog, but not necessarily our uh, classification algorithm. So it's often useful to have a, a classification that's going to give you some number between zero and one. And intuitively, we should think of this number as a probability that our belief that the outcome is one or zero. But now the question is, how, we, how do we mathematically uh, formulate this, uh, this, this notion that, the, that this number actually corresponds to such a belief? And uh, this formulating, is actually related to the notion of uh, calibration. So, uh, calibration is a desired probability of a classification algorithm that's not necessarily directly related to accuracy. So, obviously, when we come up with a, a classification algorithm, our most desired quality is uh, accuracy. We want this algorithm to be as often correct as possible. But calibration concerns not quite making uh, as often as possible a correct decision, but being able to understand when our decision is certain, certain or, or not. And let me like, just uh, start with a very simple example which will uh, kind of illustrate what I mean by this calibration. Let's say that we have a population of uh, where half of the populations are the pictures of cat and exactly half of the populations are dogs. Then it turns out that it is relatively simple to uh, come up with a, uh, a model that is going to be perfectly calibrated by in the, the sense that I will describe uh, like define later. Uh, so specifically, if we have a model that doesn't even look at the picture itself and just outputs half all the time, uh, I want to say, sure, this model is not like the, the accuracy is terrible, it's making always uh, an error, but at least it under, understands well its own uncertainty. Whenever it says half, 
you know, I think there's chances uh, how like fifty percent that it's a dog. It's really like how the pictures are dogs. So this is a, a kind of perfectly calibrated predictor. And obviously, as I say on this example, uh, like coming up with a perfectly calibrated predictor body by itself is not nothing very special. Uh, what is interesting is to come up with a predictors that are both accurate and calibrated. So, like we should uh, focus mostly on making our predictors accurate. But given a choice between two predictors with the same accuracy, we better choose one that is uh, also calibrated. And this, uh, like we can see, it even more when uh, the the, the uh, domain becomes more and more critical. The, the importance of this calibration. Let's say that. We think not about classifications of cat of cats versus dogs, more of uh, some sort of medical diagnosis uh, uh, situation. Then surely it's extremely important to be as often correct as possible. But it's also very useful to know on which examples we are uncertain. What is the answer? And uh, have some sort of uh, measure that, that that quantifies this. Now. With this example in mind, it is actually relatively simple to define what I mean mathematically, what I mean for a, a predictor to be perfectly calibrated. So, the, the, well, being perfectly calibrated is going to be a property of a random pair of a prediction, which is a number in the range zero and one, and the outcome, which is a couple somehow with the prediction, and is going to be number that's either zero or one. And I'm going to say that such a pair is perfectly calibrated, such a predictor is perfectly calibrated, if among all the examples for which my prediction was P, see, among all the examples for which I said 70%, uh, there is a 70% chance that it's a cat, exactly 70% uh, of those actually have outcome one, actually are cats. Right? So this is like, relatively natural definition of, uh, of uh, calibration that we can generalize from the example that I gave. Now, here's the clue. Uh, it turns out that like, obviously we will never see in the wild predictors that are perfectly calibrated. The same way we never see predictors that are perfectly accurate. And uh, so the main question isn't what is supposed to be perfectly calibration, perfect calibration. The main question is how should we quantify the degree of miscalibration? The same way, for accuracy, we can compute some sort of mean square error, like how to quantify how miscalibrated is our predictor. And it turns out that this question is surprisingly much more subtle than, than you'd think, much more subtle than for accuracy itself. And uh, we can see that this, is, uh, this question is uh, much more difficult just because a lot of people actually define the degree of miscalibration. And I will review a couple of those definitions and uh, I will uh, try to argue that some of them are mathematically unsatisfying, uh, at the least. So one of the most common definitions of the calibration error that's present in the literature is so-called expected calibration error. And it's uh, this is something that's, like, well, it's some sort of permutation of all the symbols that appeared in the definition of the, the perfect calibration. So it might, you know, like if you look at it on a first glance, it looks like it might even make sense. So what's going to what's happening here is that if I have a predictor, like pair of prediction and outcome, to measure to define the expected calibration and all of this, I'm going to condition on say a given prediction P, calculate the expected outcome condition on this prediction. It's something. I subtract the, the actual prediction, take the absolute value of this, and average of all possible predictions. Now, I claim that like, even though it looks like you know it has all the correct symbols, it is actually a, a rather unsatisfying definition. So let's go back to our first example of something that I claim to uh, that I want to have. Uh, I want to be perfectly calibrated. So we have a populations of cats and dogs, and I have a very trivial perfectly calibrated predictor, which always outputs half on the populations where half of the examples are cats, half are dogs. And if I, I measure this or calculate this expected calibration error of my perfectly calibrated predictors, everything works well. It is actually zero and is always going to be zero for perfectly calibrated predictor. This conditional expectation is just always equal to P by, by definition, and this difference is zero. If we average it out, it's going to be zero. Now, let's look at this slight perturbation of this example. Let's say that for all the dogs, my predictor actually outputs half plus 10 to negative 300. 
And so all the cuts, my predictor outputs of minus 10 to negative 300. This isn't like any meaningful physical, you know, noticeable difference. This is essentially the same predictor. You can tell what's happening 300 digits after the decimal point. But if you plug in now the slight perturbation to the definition of the expected calibration error, it's going to turn out that the expected calibration error of our new in, in, uh, physically indistinguishable predictor from the previous one is almost as bad as possible. It's almost half, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you, you know, if a condition on the uh, prediction being half plus epsilon, all the outcomes are one. So in this case, the absolute difference is is uh, basically half. In the other case, absolute difference is basically half as well. I average over this. It's it's like the 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 EC is 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 almost maximal. This is like this discontinuity in the prediction is just like very weird feature and this doesn't doesn't make much sense. And it uh, like uh, it has you know the the consequence of this is that like this this the definition is very unworkable in practice. Like for example, how do I even estimate this expected calibration error from any finite sample? If my prediction is some sort of like continuous random variable that for example, given from a neural net, net, then like more often than not, for every given prediction, I will have only one outcome of this. Like in this, this uh, conditional expectation is going to be expectation of like average of one one object, and this, this whole thing won't, will uh, somehow collapse. Now, the other notion that's uh, like that one way of trying to fix it and a quantity, like a measure of calibration, that's also very popular in the literature. Right? essentially the thing that people do in, when they want to measure the calibration in, in practice is a uh, so-called binning ECE, or the, uh, I'm going to call it this way. And it is essentially like the first approximation is just saying, okay, let's run our prediction to the nearest you know, multiple of 10% and try to calculate ECE. It's not quite that. Let me explain what it's doing exactly. But it's this order of uh, idea. So what's happening is, uh, I plotted here on the, the, the plot uh, like a bunch of instantiations of my random variable py. So the dots here on the bottom line are uh, experiments where the outcome was zero. The dots on the top line are the experiments where the outcome was one. And you know the photo it is to the right is uh, you know the 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 the, uh, the x-axis here that denotes the prediction. So here I have like this this little dot, blue dot here denotes an experiment. The prediction was maybe ninety percent, and the outcome ended up being one. So given a bunch of uh, this kind of uh, like a sample of this form, the way I calculate this uh, binning ECE is for a given size of the like discretization of the prediction interval, I look at all the all the backers like all the uh, all the experiments for which my prediction was say between zero and ten percent. Uh, in each in a bracket like this, I average all outcomes, and I average all the prediction. I take the difference between the like absolute difference uh, between this and sum of all possible buckets, basically, like, while multiplying by the weight of a bucket or something like that. And so it just like bracket the the range of the predictions like. The, the, the range of the predictions in each bracket, calculate average prediction, average outcome, take the absolute difference of this, add up over the entire range of uh, queries. And it is a definition. It's something that you can actually compute. Like, once you have a, a model, you can actually estimate this from finite sample. It makes sense. But it is still, I want to claim, somewhat unsatisfying. First of all, it is still discontinuous. So if I fix a bucket size and like weird things happen near the near the bucket boundary, I like change my prediction by some epsilon things uh, like fall in a different bucket, I might have a ECE, like meaning ECE that jumps all the way by a bucket size or something. Now, so the, like it doesn't really solve the, this discontinuity problem. It uh, introduce a couple of other problems, like how to choose the bucket size and how the choice of the bucket size will impact the error. And there has been actual papers where, you know, they wanted to com uh, compare two different models, and it ended up that one is better calibrated with bigger bucket size, the other is better calibrated with smaller bucket sizes. It's actually how to think of it. Um, and 
Uh, from just kind of a theoretical perspective, you might ask why why this is like uh, you know this is a, like a specific algorithm, but it doesn't seem like a fundamentally like right way to measure calibration error. It's it's just like kind of very arbitrary. Now another uh, definition that has been uh, present in the literature is so-called smooth calibration error, and I gave a like this was a formula defining it. And it's a bit confusing. Uh, I will slightly explain it right now, and we'll go back to it later. But this is like, so uh, what, it, what, what this formula says, whenever I have a pair P and Y, let's look at uh, the Lipschitz function of a prediction, such that the correlation between this W of P and the residue of outcome minus prediction is as large as possible. And uh, like compute this co correlation, and. I claim that this is my calibration error. Now, it turns out that it is actually quite well behaved. Like, one thing that is easy to check is that whenever I have a perfectly calibrated predictor, then this smooth calibration error is actually equal to zero. Yes? The converse is also true, right? Sorry? The converse is also true? Yes, yes, yes. This is only for perfectly calibrated predictors. But uh, it's it takes a little bit, uh, like it's a little bit less obvious. The, 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 this direction is very obvious. If I have a perfectly calibrated predictor, then the smooth calibration error is equal to zero. Moreover, it turns out that it doesn't have the discontinuity issue. It's, it's behaving nicely, uh, but you know, like this definition by itself is a little bit contrived, and it's uh, also not clear like why this should be the grand grand two notion of the calibration error. Was the motivation for introducing this the, the issues that you presented before, or um, yes, 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 and it was like introduced as some sort of analytic tool towards getting the calibration, but it's it, you know it isn't necessarily by with this definition as we see it right now, it's not necessarily like the, the, the something that's that's already that uh, and and uh, and uh, final answer to the problem how to define the calibration error. Okay, so with this state of the uh, state of the affairs, we figured that, that we should come up with some sort of more kind of uh, principled way of trying to define the calibration error, and we tried to do it in this, like slightly axiomatic way. So let's ask ourselves what are the properties we want from the calibration error, and let's see what, what it is going to lead us. And uh, spoiler alert, alert is it, it is going to lead us to something that you can actually compute efficiently and is actually useful, but also has a bunch of nice properties and a bunch of nice revelations, maybe also about known measures of calibration error. So, was the previous one uh, computable in a reasonable way? The, which one? This one. Uh, this one. And like, yeah, this one. This, this one. one. Uh, it, uh, it is, it's uh, like as I stated, it, it is not clear, but this is also one of our contributions mm -hmm. that you can compute those things. It's it might actually not be the, too difficult. I'm not sure like whether it was. Yeah, I don't I don't think it was explicitly stated in the literature, but you can do this optimization. Uh, so we, this can be computable, but you know, in principle, there is some sort of optimization of early choice functions. Maybe it's not that obvious. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so what we will end up is going to like explain a bunch of the, the uh, bunch of the mess in this current state of affair. So uh, yes, oh, just, just adding to the answer you gave, I, I might be misremembering, but I think in the KF zero eight paper they also show that the generalization of smooth calibration error to multi label prediction mm -hmm. uh, is unlikely to be it like the. C computing it is likely to have exponential runtime in the number of labels. Uh, yeah, well, I uh, to be honest, I'm not sure about their paper, but we do know that it is. Uh, I do know that this is true. Yes, like I, I have a lower bounds for this. Ah, okay. So, uh, but we are like this is something that we are currently working on, like how to actually face the things uh, in a way that's efficient in the multi-class setting. Like how to use this deal to, to uh, extend it to the multi-class setting and come up with some sort of relaxation maybe of the notion that, that you can compete with like number of samples that doesn't scale exponentially but i want to be talking about this for now it's like uh, i do believe that the multi-class setting is interesting but 
you know, the first step is have uh, like good understanding of the binary binary case, and I I hope that we have a, a nice nice ideas for how to think this. Uh, yeah, I don't know if it, it was proven in case zero one, but I have a, a lower band there. No. So, yes, sir. Is it, isn't it the same convex program works for the multi-class setting? So guessing uh, the value of W in each point and ensuring slip sheets? Uh, well, the convex program will work. The problem is how many samples do you need in order for the uh, in order for the smooth calibration error of the empirical distribution to resemble anything that's uh, ah, okay. smooth calibration error of the population distribution. Ah, that makes and sense. if you don't send, like if you don't sample exponentially many samples, you will always find a like uh, Lipschitz function that will you know show that the calibration error is as large as possible because you will be able to feed it in in any way you want it. All right, that makes perfect sense. But this is this is what, what's happening here. Uh, anyway, so uh, like we have this few, few notions, some will behave, but yeah, uh, we, we try to, to come up with uh, like some principled way of, of thinking of this. And here are uh, some basic properties that we want for our calibration and, and uh, the starting point is that uh, we want the calibration error to agree with us on what are perfectly calibrated predictors. So. Uh, like this is the, the question of the algebra smooth calibration error. Ah, at the very least, whatever I define as the calibration error, it should be zero for all perfectly calibrated uh, predictors and only for the perfectly calibrated predictors. But as we saw in the examples of ECE, this isn't quite satisfying. We really would like to have some sort of robust, generally, like robust versions of those completeness and suddenness properties. So specifically, if we have a predictor such that, you know, a small perturbation of it is perfectly calibrated, then better my measure of calibration error should be small. And dually, for suddenness, whenever I am far from any perfectly calibrated predictor, I, I, I require my measure of the uh, calibration to be large. Or you can say the only reason for my uh, calibration error to be uh, small is that there is some perfectly calibrated predictor that's nearby. And with these two properties in hand, there is like very obvious, you know, if I just state those two properties, there's very obvious thing that it can do, you know. What is a function that's small for things that are far and small for things that are close and large for things that are far is a distance, right? So I can say, okay, uh, my measure of calibration error is a distance to the calibration. Which is, you know, given a pair p and y, I'm asking what is the closest random variable pw, p, p tilde, such that the L1 distance between p and p tilde is as small as possible, but the pair p tilde y is perfectly calibrated. So on our, you know, cuts and uh, dots example, like the slightly perturbed example, is going like the distance the calibration is going to answer the, the correct pink. Right? I can. You know, I can choose as p2 that a, a constant function half, and this expected error is going to be, you know, expected absolute value of p minus p2 that is going to be always epsilon. So this is nice. This definition has is still not satisfying for quite a bit more subtle reason. Namely, everything that I was talking about before, uh, like every you know property measure was actually a property of a distribution of a pair p and y right if you want to calculate the mean square or accuracy or something like this check whether it's perfectly calibrated those are all properties of the distribution of the pair p and y whereas this distance to calibration is property of the actual probability space on which this pair of random variable is defined i'm asking about this the closest p tilde to p you know, this is like a function defined on the probability space. It's, it's, it's a bit of a mess. Uh, so I'm going to just proclaim that I don't like this. I want. I don't understand the distinction. What uh, can you describe, sure. describe a little more? What do you mean by this? Uh, so, so why, why is so what, I'm saying, the probability space here? Uh, so I'm saying that. Uh, what does it mean here to ask about you know the random variable p tilde that's uh, uh, such that p tilde y is 
theta of the y is perfectly calibrated, and the absolute value of p minus theta of the uh, is uh, as small as possible. Well, what does this value of random variable leaves? It's, it's a function from, uh, uh, so maybe. So is that the case that you don't want to compare probabilities? You don't think the distance between p and p two is an adaptation? Uh, if I want to, yes, like, if I want to look at the distance between p and p two, they are like, I'm kind of already assuming that they are somehow coupled. So maybe the different way of uh, thinking of this is, like, let's imagine, that uh like let's imagine that uh, this p is really some sort of i don't know like neural network or something so some function that maps features to uh to the the, the outcome mm -hmm. and i'm asking okay well, well what is the closest f2 that is perfectly calibrated i'm asking what is the you know find me a different function that maps the same features to outcomes Mm -hmm. And it says that the difference between f and f tilde on the, with respect to the probability distribution that I have on the features is as small as possible. But this kind of like getting into the, the inner workings of how this predictor mm -hmm. P works, like it maps some features to outcome is, is, is kind of like unsatisfying uh, because everything else, you know, you just draw, give me a distribution of, uh, uh, give me a distribution of the pair prediction outcome, I can, I can uh, tell you, uh, I can uh, write the, 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 the calculate the, the, the probability. Mm -hmm. So I hope that this answers the, the questions a bit. No? Yeah. Any other questions about it? I don't, so the, the reason I don't fully understand is because it seems to me that if you just gave me a distribution of a P and Y, mm -hmm. I could still compute this, fun, this measurement, couldn't I? So uh, yes, let me jump in here. <laughs> I, I might be anticipating an uh, upcoming mm -hmm. slide, but it, if we just allow p tilde to be a random variable in a larger sample space mm -hmm. that is correlated with p and y, and then we take the infimum over joint distributions Perfect. of the triple p tilde p and y. Perfect. That's exactly what you're going to do. Oh, that's what I thought so was that, happening yes. here. No, no. So what he was saying here was p tilde has to take a single value on each point of the sample space where p and y are defined. It's not allowed to take a distribution of values. Oh, okay, okay. So if he relaxes this to take a distribution of values, as he will do on the next slide, then your question goes away, right? Oh, okay. That, yeah, that, that's what I thought. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. That, Thank you. Yes. Okay. That was that was already happening, but it's good. Exactly. Yes, thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot. That's that's great. So uh, before like this, I'm going to be on the next slide on the one after this. Okay. <laughs> I just want to collect uh, the three properties that I that I, I mentioned uh, as my desirable properties. So uh, I'm going to say that uh, something is a, a consistent calibration measure if you know it's uh, upper and lower bounded by some by the distance to calibration, maybe to some powers. So it has this robust completeness, robust soundness, but also depends only on the distribution of the pair and P and Y. And now, uh, yes, let's let's do exactly what what you proposed. Like there is a very brutal way of making like this distance to calibration depend only on the distribution. Specifically, we can do like two different things, and I'm going to define two quantities that are like depend only on the distribution of P and Y in a very kind of uh, in a naive and brutal way. Take, look at, I, uh, I give you a distribution of the pair P and Y. Look at all possible random variables that have this distribution uh, and, uh, and uh, in, you know, compute the uh, distance to calibrations in each of the spaces and let's define the lower distance to be the infinite over all possible uh, things like this, and the upper distance to the calibration as supremum of all possible distances in all, all possible realizations. This is like rather abstract way uh, of doing this, but it at least gets rid of the problem that it is not defined on the, the, the now the things that depends only on the probability distribution of P and, of P and Y. And uh, we will see that both of those things, even though have been defined in a bit the uh, grander way, way are actually tangible and they have a, a very nice uh, descriptions in terms of objects that we are, we are familiar with. So first of all, just by the definition, it's very obvious, like this is just the definition that like lower distance to calibration and the upper distance to calibration is, uh, you know, tightest lower and upper bounds on the distance to calibration on a given probability space. And the first things that we proved making 
this kind of definitions uh, sensible is that we actually can upper bound the upper one by the lower one, by square root of the lower one. So those are both kind of polynomially related quantities. They go to zero at least together. Um, Sorry, I'm too confused actually what's, yeah. what's going on here. Or maybe maybe I'll Seth, maybe he's asking the same question that I do. But sure, I'll, I'll try. I'm trying to wrap my head around what we mean by has the same distribution as if like there's a joint distribution of, you know, uh, samples Y and probabilities we assign to them wouldn't the, if two things have the same joint distribution wouldn't the calibration error be equal do you mean they have the same marginal distributions or am I missing? So yes i i yeah. do want to define the calibration error such that the the uh, uh calibration error will be equal but this object that i defined the distance to calibration which is you know you give me a random variable that's defined on some probability space uh, like random pair defined on some probability space i'm asking you what is the closest p tilde on the same probability space? This is, you know, this depends on uh, the, the the probability space on which the, those things are chosen, not only on the distribution. So there's some data generating process of pictures exactly. of animals, and my function assigns a number to them of the probability it's a dog, and the y is the you know data com the distribution of data comes in, the p is the assignment, and you know. Like, no. sorry, sorry, this is like, uh, let me try to explain the, uh, this. Uh, it's, uh, yes, it, took a, it takes a little bit more time than, than no, I was hoping, but let's, uh, let's, let me try to explain the issue. Let's imagine that we have some data generating focus over features, and we have uh, a map, like the predictor that maps features to a, uh, a prediction. Now, the distance to calibration is asking, okay, uh, I'm only allowed to look at other functions that maps, you know, other neural networks, whatever, other, other functions that maps these features to some outcome. And I want to compare, like, the different, you know, I want to find the same map that maps the features to outcomes. Uh, and I want to compare the, this, the uh, expected difference between my map f from the some other uh, map f tilde whereas uh the notions that i care about are, are saying uh, like the the the, the, the notions that i'm going to discuss those <clears throat> low and upper distances are saying you aren't allowed to look at uh the process that maps features to to, to the prediction you are only allowed to look at the probability distribution of prediction and outcome I'm not sure if uh, yeah, I'm not sure if the distinction has been. Let's 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 keep keep going. I'm going to stew over it as I see what you're doing with it. Uh, yes, uh, yes. Beth, I, I I have an example that might be responsive to your question. So, so suppose uh, that p is always equal to a half and y is equal to zero or one with 50-50 probability. Um, that could be realized by having a sample space with two sample points where P is a half and Y is zero and where P is a half and Y is one. Or it could be realized on a sample space with four sample points where P is always a half and on two of those sample points, Y is zero and on the other two, Y is one. And so, so those are a PY and a P tilde Y tilde that have the same distribution, but it's two different probability spaces because they have different numbers of sample points. And it, that difference makes a, that distinction could be important from the standpoint of Yaroslav's definition, because when he's computing DCE, he's constructing a random variable P prime, I forget what it was called, mm -hmm. on that sample space that's correlated with P and Y. So the ability to find it on four sample points instead of two might give him more degrees of freedom to fit the calibration better. Yes, I thank see. you. That's, that's, that's... So it's like projecting down to sort of just P, Y and their joint distribution is ignoring a lot of information, which gives us room to find other, uh, other, other functions, which end up matching the same joint distribution, something exactly. like this. Uh, I guess yes. it makes sense to me. Essentially, there's a joint, the joint, 
uh, the solution of a triple that projects back to P and Y. It's been the same. That's the, the same intuition. Exactly. Uh, okay. Uh, yes. Well, let's, uh, like maybe some of the the, the, the things that will uh, uh, we will uh, we will uh, like some of the ways we will unwind this uh, lower and upper distance to the calibrations are going to be a little bit more intuitive than this. Like. This is exactly why this distance to calibration is not the right thing to do, just because it's, it's confusing. Lower and upper distance, I promise you, are going to be slightly uh, better things, even though they are defined as some sort of like large infimum or, or, or supremum over like, all the random variables that have the same distribution. Uh, so, yes, uh, like what it's going to turn out is that we can actually uh, equivalently express those new definitions in terms that are uh, uh like a little bit more workable and i will start with upper distance to calibration which is actually the poorer behavior of those two so it turns out that the upper distance to calibration is actually equal to the closest perfectly calibrated predictor uh, kappa of py that can be or closest perfectly calibrated predictor that can be obtained from the my predictor p by some sort of univariate post-processing so like the distance to calibration told me okay find me arbitrary uh, predictor that's on the same probability space that has uh, you know is perfectly calibrated and it's close here i'm restricting to you that what you are the only thing that you are allowed to do is apply some sort of univariate function to the prediction to p and i'm asking you uh, what is the best univariate function that you can find kappa of p such that this pair kappa of p y is perfectly calibrated now and you know this distance between you know uh, average between p and kappa of p is as small as possible uh, and this like obviously is uh, uh, obviously is like depends only on the distribution of p and y and moreover it's always an upper bound for the distance to calibration right like you know this is asking about a subset of possible uh, perfectly calibrated predictor uh, so and uh, i will prove that i uh, alluded to earlier that uh, the upper distance to calibration is bounded by the square root of the lower one essentially is saying that whenever you give me a, a coupling p and p tilde such that p tilde is perfectly calibrated and you know p is my predictor and p and is close to p tilde, you can find also a somewhat close predictor that's uh, obtained from p by composition with some function kappa, univariate composition by some function kappa. So if I know that I'm like epsilon close to a perfectly calibrated predictor, I'm squared epsilon close to a perfectly calibrated predictor that's obtained from p just by some sort of univariate composition. And yes, this is uh, something that we prove. So it's saying that uh, the, both the upper and lower distance to calibrations are uh, consistent calibration measures. Now, the other, the, the lower distance to calibrations is actually a bit more uh, interesting object that uh, I think you, you, you guys have alluded to earlier. And uh, to explain what it is, let me remind you uh, a notion of a construction of a Wasserstein distance. So, so whenever I have a metric space, uh xd i can define a distance on all probability distributions uh supported like uh, with values in this metric space and it's going it's a so-called wasserstein distance which is asking you know the distance between two distributions on a metric space mu1 and mu2 is infinitum over all possible couplings such that the marginal distribution of x is mu1 marginal distribution of x prime is mu2 and for every coupling like this i take the expectation of the distance of x and x prime this is something that's called earth mover distance as well and uh what what it turns out is that like if i choose a mat metric on this space of you know interval times zero one so the space on which my pair of prediction outcome uh, lives and the metric is you know and each of the intervals take just a normal matrix that's induced on the interval and put those two intervals infinitely far away from each other then this lower notion, lower distance to calibration is exactly Wasserstein distance of my probability distribution 
to the set of perfectly calibrated predictors, which is basically the same as saying, find me any coupling of P, P prime Y, such that P Y has the distribution that is given, P prime Y is perfectly calibrated, and the distance between P and P prime is as small as possible. So uh, this is pretty, like, this is pretty good, but this is a Vassar stand distance. People have worked a lot on Vassar stand distance, and there is a lot of theory. Let's, uh, uh, let's try to use it. One thing that we know about Vassar stand distance is the so so-called Cantorovich Rubinstein duality. It's an instance of uh, like linear programming duality in saying that we can equivalently state the Vassar stand distance with it, which is a minimization problem, find the minimal coupling such that the expected distance is as close as possible as a maximization problem. This Wasserstein distance between two probability distributions is the supremum over all possible Lipschitz functions W of the distance difference between the average of X of mu1 or of W with respect to mu1 and average of W with respect to mu2. Yes? Sorry, could you go back one slide? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I was expecting you to say that the lower distance calibration is the W1 distance from D to the subset of perfectly calibration, subset of perfectly calibrated distributions that have the same marginal distribution of Y. Um, yes, th so this is uh captured by the fact that i'm putting uh infinite distance between Good. those two intervals okay yeah thanks <laughs> so i'm not allowed to, to switch by yes so we have this control of Rubinstein duality which is saying that uh, the basel stein distance is uh uh equal to the supremum of all Lipschitz functions uh, of you know difference between the this expectation of Lipschitz functions and now uh, uh, okay and now um, like you you might find this as to be somewhat similar to things that have happened in this talk before like we have super, like optimization maximization problem of all possible Lipschitz functions. And I told you that there was this uh, smooth calibration thing, which is exactly the maximization of problem of all possible Lipschitz functions. And it turns out that like, using a very similar proof to the Kantorovich Rubinstein duality, we can actually show that this lower distance to calibration that we have introduced, which is the Wasserstein turn distance to the nearest perfectly calibrated predictor, is basically equal up to a constant factor to this other well behaved and previously introduced measure the smooth calibration error. Uh, and like the reason why it's well behaved, it's uh, smooth calibrated, uh, it's uh, well behaved and it's, uh, you know, it captures well our notion of the distance to calibration is that it's, you know, just dual formulation of the Wasserstein distance to, 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 to perfectly calibrate the set, which arguably is a, a nat natural thing to do. Uh, I will try very briefly to uh, give a, a proof of this it's uh, it's not uh, okay actually before I, I give a proof of this let me say that out of this proof and out of the the uh, like the, this consideration what we could prove like what, what follows is that both of this lower distance to calibration and smooth calibration at all you can estimate some finite samples. This was known for the smooth calibration error uh, before. We proved that this is also true for the uh, like Wasserstein distance to the nearly uh, perfectly calibrated predictor. This is relatively simple because of concentration uh, of measure for the Wasserstein distance. So uh, the uh, Wasserstein, like the, the lower distance to calibration, is well approximated by is uh, the, the the distance to calibration on a finite sample. And also, we can actually compute this, those quantities with a linear program, both the smooth calibration error, which I guess you guys already knew, and the uh, lower distance to calibration, which, because it's a certain distance, we will see that you can compute with some sort of linear program. It doesn't like, we have the factor of four difference between those two, and this, so this isn't quite a trivial statement. Like, in principle, you know, approximating one is a different thing than approximating uh, another. So, 
like uh, all those things you can compute. And by the way, like you can actually write a code, use some sort of off-the-shelf linear programming solver and run this on like reasonably large sample and it's going to work. So it's not um okay. So let me now uh try to uh, like quickly go over the, the 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 ideas here in this proof of the uh on the duality. Uh first as usually is the case with those kind of duality statements one inequality is very easy, the other is, is a string duality and requires some work. So first of all, smooth calibration error is always upper bounded by this Wasserstein distance to the perfectly calibrated predictor. This is something that I had alluded to before when saying that the smooth calibration error is kind of continuous. And uh, the way you prove it is, you know, if you unwind all the definitions, you'll uh, see that the, we get back to the coupling that you mentioned that if my, uh, lower distance to calibration is small, it means that I have a coupling between yp and p prime, such that yp comes from my distribution, yp prime is perfectly calibrated, and the expectation of absolute value of p and uh, minus p prime is, is small. And now, like if you have this and you want to upper bound this smooth calibration area, just choose arbitrary function, Lipschitz function w, and you know, plug in things, you used to uh, triangle inequalities, you use the fact that W is Lipschitz, and you just kind of band this by the difference between P and P prime, and the smooth calibration error of P prime Y. But, but P prime Y is perfectly calibrated, so this, this thing is zero, the other thing is small. This uh, I went over this very quickly, but uh, I guess the main message should be that like this is the easy direction in the, uh, the duality statement needs uh, a calculation. Now, so the other direction, uh, let me at least phrase how to write it as a linear program. And the rest is basically, you know, you take the formal dual, you do some algebra, and you can, you know, get uh, like out of the strong duality, you can get the witness W. So the problem, uh, like to prove the upper band, the problem we are at is we have a distribution for which we know that the Wasserstein and movers distance to the nearest perfectly calibrated uh, distribution is large. We want to find some Lipschitz function W, witnessing that this smooth calibration error is large. So a Lipschitz function W such that this correlation is large. And the first thing that we will do is we will run our distributions. Uh, like we will choose some sort of epsilon that much smaller than delta and just run our predictions to the like integer of multiples of epsilon. This is uh, basically so that like the entire linear problems is go is becoming fin finitely dimensional. So we have a distribution. Let's find a distribution D, a landing of the, the prediction to the nearest multiples of epsilon. Note that this near distribution after landing is close in the Wasserstein distance to our distribution that we have started from. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we started with a promise that uh, we are. We have a distribution that's far from perfectly calibrated. After running, we are also far from perfe perfectly calibrated. Marvin, we are. Uh, let's let now p epsilon be the set of perfectly calibrated distribution that also has a prediction that uh, have discrete values. If I'm far from any perfectly calibrated distribution, I'm also far from uh, perf any perfectly calibrated distribution that has only like discrete uh, discrete outcomes of the, 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 the probability. So the situation I'm in is I have some distribution that's supported only on integer multiples of epsilon, and I know that it's far from the nearest perfectly calibrated distribution that's also supported on uh, the uh, some multiples of epsilon. Uh, uh, so, uh, what I want to say now is that uh, now, like all my distributions are actually expressed by a finite number of parameters, right? Like all of those live in a fin finitely dimensional space. Uh, I can write a distribution as just a collection of numbers that are all non negative and add up to zero, add up to one. Uh, I want to say that in the space of all distributions, actually, 
a set of perfectly calibrated distributions is a polydor, is cut off by a bunch of hyperplanes. So this is like the, the, the only kind of non-trivial statement here. Uh, so this is just saying that my mu is a, is a probability distribution supported on this discrete set. To say that this is a perfectly calibrated, I want to say that for every p, the conditional, uh, like the expected outcome uh, condition on the, the, the prediction being p is equal to p. And if you just kind of multiply and clear off the den uh, denominators and like does something simple, it turns out that this expression is given that for each point p is given by a linear equality. So a uh, set of uh, perfectly calibrated distribution is just some sort of polytop that, that's cut off by those inequalities and a bunch of, bunch of equalities. Now, uh, to calculate, say, for two given uh, probability distributions, mu and nil, this is well known that to calculate the Wasserstein distance between those two, there's some sort of a flow problem in the graph, or essentially also a, a linear program, right? If I'm given two distributions, mu and mu, on this on this graph, uh, finding a Wasserstein distance between those two is finding the minimum flow on this graph that moves the distribution need to, to mu. So it is a linear program in flow variables that denotes you know, how much flow is moving from left to right, or if it's negative, how much flow is going from right to left. The distance is given by the you know, total cost of a flow, and the constraints are some sort of flow consistency constraints that on each point, you know, if I'm starting from the distribution new, I have uh, I calculate what is the total outgoing incoming and outgoing flow. I want to end up with the distribution mu. So solving this linear program gives me a, a Wasserstein distance between those two probability distributions. So now finding a Wasserstein distance from a given distribution mu to some perfectly calibrated distribution is, you know, just add to this linear program, like face the target distribution, not as parameters of the linear problem, but as variables in the linear problem, add the constraints that comes from the fact that the set of perfectly calibrated distributions is a polytope. So those are all just linear inequalities and equalities. If the flow consistency constraint, the optimism, like the objective in the, is the same, I just phrased, I just gave you an, a linear program that computes, computes this like kind of discretized version of the low, low, low distance to calibration. And uh, with this linear program in hand, the rest is like literally uh, an exercise in uh, you know in duality. You write down all the uh, constraints. You take the formal dual. You do a bunch of algebra with inequalities back and forth. You end up learning that like extracting out of the dual witness for this linear program the the, the function w that we wanted to witness smooth calibration error to be large, and like then you can deal with the. Then you can deal with the, the the rounding things and epsilon. Take epsilon to zero. The rest is, uh, yes. The, the rest is very like not even very technical. The, the rest are, are technical. It is that are very uh, standard. And uh, it, it, well, with this you can all clearly kind of calculate all those exam all those uh, all those you know measures exactly just by solving the linear problems that I used here in the analysis to show the duality. Uh, and right, like the the the, the sample con uh, concentrations, also a uh, thing. So that's that's pretty much it. Thank you. There are some other stuff. Um, the the discretizing. Oh, I had a question. The um, the discretizing method you use in the proof. It it, it in some ways looks like the the bucketing that people use informally. Or you know, mm -hmm. okay, everything from ten to twenty percent. Is there anything to that analogy? Is there a way in which you know mm -hmm. um, there's a bucket, a version of the bucketing, which you know, with arbitrary epsilon or something that should be using? Or no, no, it no, no be... it's uh, not actually. Uh, it's actually not the that analogous. It turns out that you know, here uh, the finer discretization we get just the better approximation of, you know, 
whatever is the underlying Wasserstein distance, like in the the, the real space we are getting. So, uh, you, like you basically can compute whatever is the real uh, whatever is the real smooth calibration error up to arbitrary small additive epsilon, error epsilon by just choosing the discretization epsilon. Uh, and like uh, you know, the only thing that you're paying with is uh, you 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 spend maybe more time solving the linear problem. Uh, but like in the analysis, like we really can even take the limit epsilon going to zero at the end to to say that you know we are proving that for every epsilon, uh, say this quantity is at most two times this quantity plus epsilon. And this is just true for every possible epsilon. We, can, we take the limit uh, epsilon to zero. Uh, it's like I guess some of those things you could do if you like fancy without the discretization, but by just using some sort of uh, you know infinite dimensional dualities and infinite dimensional cases of uh, hyperplane separation. And you like, didn't really need this, but maybe for us computer scientists, it's easier to just reason about those things in the uh in the 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 the, 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 the finite finitely dimensional setting and uh, good like take the epsilon to zero i know uh, proof the proof mm -hmm. any other questions yeah uh you, your uh distance to calibration was all based on wasserstein one distance mm -hmm. If I base it on Wasserstein Q distance for some other value of Q other than one, have you investigated at all whether that gives a qualitatively different notion of distance to caliber? Uh, uh, so, uh, yes and no. Like here, our uh, definition of the uh, consistent calibration measure is saying, like, you know, this thing should be a polynomial approximation of the distance to calibration. So you have these exponents like alpha, beta. And this is because like the lower and the upper are kind of distance to calibration are kind of polynomially related to begin with when you have this all with respect to L1 distance. And now it turns out that if you choose a different metric on the look either a different metric on the sorry, uh, yes, if you just choose the L2 like Wasserstein two distance or say for the uh, say for the distance to calibration, you, if you choose like L2 distance here as opposed to L1 distance, you will, you know, get things that might be like sometimes uh, squared of the, the previous. Like, they are all polynomially related, ah, okay. but in some cases you will get like something that's like, you know, the, 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 the things will become, the epsilon will become epsilon squared or something, right? But they are all okay. polynomially okay. related, so Great. in terms of this, this, this there's no thing kind of robust. Mm -hmm. Are there any insights from this work on how to calibrate a prediction? So let's say you have some some model that's you know that's you know it has reasonable accuracy, but it's badly miscalibrated, and you know you can consider classes of functions that would need you know, mappings that would that would improve the calibration with respect to this measure. Are there some uh, insights? Uh, yes. Uh, so this is a topic of a, a paper that we are finishing now. Uh, that uh, yes, 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 perfect. Uh, we, we have investigated exactly this. Some insight how to improve the calibration, and also some insight how to explain why some things are uh, well calibrated. And the upshot is that with the technology, basically you can ask. Uh, you can define uh, something like uh, how much you can improve the mean square error by post composing with a, a Lipschitz function. And it turns out that this is going to be a consistent calibration measure. So if my thing is no, uh, not calibrated, like it's far from being uh, calibrated, there exists a Lipschitz function of the prediction such that I can post-compose with this Lipschitz function and improve the actual accuracy by a lot. Uh, and uh, like on the other hand, if I cannot improve the accuracy by a lot, this means that my like I am close to perfectly calibrated. So it on one hand, it, it gives an insight into why 
some models like neural network, I'm not sure if it gives a little bit debatable, but you can try to make an argument that some models that are closed under the post composition of a Lipschitz function should be often calibrated out of the box, even if they are trained only for accuracy. It's like the argument is a little bit slippery here because how do you know, like the model expresses post composition with Lipschitz function, but how do you know whether SGD will find it, right? But like you can try to make this kind of argument, but it's also like making very, uh, very specific point on like if you have a if you have a model that's not calibrated, you can find some explicitly find some post composition with a Lipschitz function that will both increase increase the accuracy and in oh sorry that will increase the accuracy, uh, and basically that's it. Like you keep doing it. You're gaining accuracy and you're happy. And at the end, like you have a model for which you cannot improve the accuracy by post composition, but now you have a model that has better accuracy and is also calibrated, which is which is fine. So this is this is in this paper, but it's something that we are like working on and planning to put in archive soon. Oh, thanks. Um, you, you may be aware of the literature on online calibration where, uh, you know, like I'm, I'm trying to predict the next label in a sequence and in the end I'm evaluated on um, mm -hmm. often like the expected calibration error mm -hmm. of the empirical distribution of predictions and labels that were generated by running the algorithm. So if we instead evaluate based on the DCE, mm -hmm. Uh, it, it, so, right, for, for the ECE objective, you know, like there's a gap between upper and lower bounds on what's known. There's an algorithm with exponent t to the two thirds, mm -hmm. where t is the number of samples. And there's a reason lower bound by Chiao and Valiant that's slightly better than the square root of t. Uh, but I'm wondering if one could hope to use this calibration measure and. That, 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 like, is, that is awesome. Uh, like great, I, to be honest, I'm not all that aware. Like I am aware that there is this. I believe that this KF paper was one in the, the lane of research that you're thinking about. Uh, yes, I think it would be it would be worth uh, like getting deeper into it. I, I haven't, to be honest. Uh, yes, that, that sounds like a, a good good point. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Right. Thank the speaker. Okay. Okay.